Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. It's so good to see you this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. If you are a first-time guest, we do want to say again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We are uh, experiencing today what we're calling Vision Sunday, and uh, we're going to be talking a bit about the vision that God's given us as a church. And really, it's pretty clear in His, in his, in his uh, Word, and we're going to do that today. In fact, you can turn to the book of Ephesians if you want to go ahead and turn there. I'll get there in a moment in just a bit. We still have some seats down here. Uh, at the front if we're looking for some folks uh, or who need seats, okay? So we're glad that you're here today. If you are a first-time guest or maybe you've been coming uh, a little bit of late, you're learning more about our church. And today's a great day to be here. This month, in fact, it's a great month uh, to be here because we're talking about the church, the power of one. You can see the different uh, pieces of the puzzle, each of us making up this beautiful picture that is called uh, the church. Now, immediately uh, on Vision Sunday, I know some of us are, are thinking, ah, come on, pastor, just give me a sermon that'll just help me like through the week. I mean, I've got a lot going on in my life. Give me something pragmatic. You know, I think that's what a lot of us would desire. You know, when people came to Jesus and said, hey, give us a plan, he always reminded them of their purpose. Which, which is to love God and love the person next to you. Love God and love your neighbor, whomever that is in front of you who's in need. That's life. You do that every day of your life, and you're going to live to the glory of God and fulfill his plan. But a lot of us, I know, when the minute we talk about, you know, and I, and I know as a pastor, I'm pretty excited about the church and all things church, and, 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 and not everybody is as hyped as I am about the church. Some of you are here and students, you're like, I, just give me a sermon to help me make it through this semester, you know, would be good. Some of you, give me three points on how I can have a better marriage. Give me five strategies towards financial freedom. That'd be a great thing. Yeah, give me some pragmatic steps. Come on. But here's the truth. This message today is the answer to every single one of those things. Every single one of those. Now, we know that Christ is the answer, ultimately, in all things. But it's through his church, the body, the hands and feet, the voice of Jesus, the very visible presence of Christ in the world, is how we live and love together and we seek all of these things and we live our lives to his glory. So today is a great day to be here. And I'm so excited about the message the Lord's given me. I saw a sign. You know, some churches have signs, a little marquee out front. I saw a sign in front of a church. No kidding. It said, um, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> um, and I, I thought, I think I know. I think I know what they're trying to say. Um, <laughs> But words, words matter, right? Um, and, and, you know, the church, uh, some of us clearly have, we've had, let's, let's be honest, some of us have, have had some real challenges in, in church. Uh, some of us have been hurt by a church in the past. Or, you know, I talk to people all the time who are coming here uh, from other churches. And, well, this went down. Or maybe you had a harsh a pastor. Or maybe even within your family, you, you kind of had a legalistic, kind of maybe even unloving folks in your, church, in, in your family who were church-going people, right? And, and didn't quite connect the gospel uh, to their lives and to the heart. But, but today we're going to talk about the beauty, the power, and, and the glory of the church, of Christ's church. Every one of us, I believe, need to recommit ourselves. Some of us, for the first time, commit ourselves to His church. And so I'm so glad that you're here uh, today, we, we want to talk today about, uh, about a healthy church, 
Uh, I did a search on Amazon. There's 18,000 books on church growth. Lots of formulas, lots of ideas, lots of strategies. Everybody's got an idea about how the church ought to, you know, it can grow. Everybody wants to write a book about it. The scriptures don't tell us a lot about here's how the church grows. The church, instead, scripture tells us it is, is, is to be healthy, and a healthy church is a growing church. Healthy things grow. Healthy grass grows, healthy kids grow, healthy adults continue to grow, and healthy churches grow. But the Lord is the one who determines those things. Now, last week we talked about how important before you're going to grow up and what we're going to talk about today, you got to show up. You got to be in close proximity with God's people and you make the gathering critical and important, a priority in your life. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the connect piece of our, of our whole church family, the power of community. I could say it this way, the power of common unity together. Last week, we talked about worship. Today, we're going to talk about connecting with each other. Next week, we're going to talk about serving with each other. And then we're going to talk about multiplying as a lifestyle. Every person discipling, every person mentoring, raising up leaders. That's ultimately our call as disciples is to be disciple makers. So last week, and I know I told you to turn to Ephesians, but look at Hebrews 10. You can see it on the screen there. We'll get to Ephesians in a sec. Um, Last week, we talked about the critical importance, the priority of the gathering. Now, today you're feeling pretty good. You're like, hey, I'm here. But I want to challenge you, as we did last week, that the weekly gathering, I would argue, is the most important discipline of the believer's life is the gathering of the saints. And it's why the writer of Hebrews says this. In fact, let's read this together. This was to be read out loud. It'd be even better, I think, if we read it together. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Now, last week, we said when we worship together, we we lift up, we look back, we remember what Christ has done, we show up, we build up, we stir up, and we get ready for the day when we will worship the Lord together throughout all eternity with all the nations of the world. It's why we're connected to every church in Dallas today brothers and sisters. We're connected to every church on the planet today. Those who receive Christ and are part of his family, we are all one in him. And today we're going to talk about this. The writer of Hebrews calls out, listen, a bad habit. I've said that if, if you show me what your habits are this week, I'll show you who you're becoming next month and a year from now and five years from now. You know, the habit of coming together is critical. And when you don't, it will kill the progress of joy, of growth, obedience in your life. So way to go, way to be here today, be here next week and the week after that. Many of you know that we've been walking through uh, a 16-month uh, process as leaders, our deacon leaders and, and our staff together. We've been walking together and leaders across the life of our church talking about a new structure on Sunday mornings. Um, our deacons voted unanimously uh, as, we, as we took steps forward. And then two weeks ago, our church family voted uh, to move ahead with a new structure on Sunday mornings. Now you see it there in your bulletin. If you're not aware of that, or if you're a guest again, maybe you haven't heard about this, but it's going to help us simplify our Sunday mornings. We become so really complicated, kind of fragmented, and it's been hard. This will make it easier for us to invite our friends to come and and to really guide them directly. It's going to simplify our, our Sunday mornings. Now you can show up on a Sunday morning and not really know. And if you're a guest, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, if you went online, like, hey, there's a class there, there's a service there, there's over there, I don't know where. And then kind of wait, where, and where's the pastor, and where's that, what... And so what we're doing is we're gathering together, simplifying our process so that first time guests and all of us can connect together and really rally our resources together to to make it happen. We're going to have connect groups at 915 across the campus, and uh, then we're going to all enter into worship together simultaneously in the great hall, the sanctuary, and in the gym and in Espanol. And so watch for that day. Here's, it's going to happen on November the 5th. So as we move forward, you'll be hearing more about that. But here's the thing, gang. This is what is interesting about uh, Park City's Baptist Church. Not every church is this way, but we are a two-time slot, 
Sunday morning church, okay? So it means that we're going to get here early. We're going to be ready. Target 9 o'clock as your time to be here. If you're serving among our preschoolers and children, even earlier. Just get here. Be ready to welcome folks. 9.15 and then 10.45. We're worshiping the Lord. Our vision forward is that every person is committed to two time slots. Not just one. And we'll talk about today the importance of being in a connect group in particular. So look at, uh, yeah, turn to Ephesians 4. You're already there. Here's what I want to talk about today. Really, the main point of the message is this, and it'll make sense as we go. A common unity in diversity brings maturity in Christ, right? Unity in diversity equals maturity, and we're all a part of this. Now, before we start to apply this kind of corporately, and it kind of goes over our heads, and we think, well, that was good, and pastor has this clear vision and scripture tells us about the church. No, no, no. Listen, this is, this is a sermon about how you can grow in the Lord towards maturity in him. This is how you can individually, personally walk and become more and more Christ-like in your life. All right. So here's how I'd say it. As we think about the power of community together, we are okay. We are, first of all, I want you to see this growing in unity of the spirit. Here's what you're going to see as we break this down. We're growing in unity. We're growing in diversity. And we're growing in maturity. All right? So I want you to think about where you fall in all of this. Look at chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse, verse 1. Now, we looked at this last week if you were here. I therefore, a prisoner. So we said the therefore is all that's come before this. In verses, I mean, chapters 1 through 3, Paul has said, don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. And here's what Christ has done. You were separated from him. You were alienated. You were strangers to the covenant. You you had no hope without God. But Christ has come to rescue you from your sin. Now that you've received him, you've been raised up with him. He's broken down the dividing wall with his flesh on the cross. He's now brought you to God and to one another so that the world might see this manifold wisdom, this multicolored wisdom of God as a church. A watching world sees us. Okay, so there's all that and more, the first three chapters. And then he says, therefore, because of all this, a prisoner of the Lord, Paul is, he's in prison, literally, urge you to walk, that is to live in such a way, all right, in in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now note this. He's not saying simply, hey, come on, come on, get worthy. Come on, be worthy of what Christ has done for you. As if it's like, okay, he did this. What are you doing? You know, it's not that. What he's saying is be worthy, consider yourself or, or show yourself worthy of who you already are in him. You're already completely forgiven, totally loved by him. Now live in that. Show the world who you are in him. So it's always, it's always, I can say it this way, it's always, you know, dogma before duty. It's theology before our practice. It's Christ's work in us before we do anything, because that's the motivation. Otherwise, Christianity just becomes another religion, kind of a moral behaviorism. And that's not the gospel. He says, because of who you are, now live this way. And here's what he says. It's out of this calling to which you've been called. That's it. You've been saved. So with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So we looked at these four graces last week, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. That's how we do this. That's how we live together. And we're all eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So here's this unity. Look at uh, verse four. You say, well, what do we have in common? What are the non-negotiables? What what are the essentials? And then that would would help us then to figure out what the the non-essentials are. This is so critical in any organization, certainly in the church. In verse four, he says, there is one body. That would be us. And by the way, that would be everyone who's received Christ as Lord in the church. It's not the Baptists up against the Presbyterians, up against the you know, Catholics who are saved, up against the Ma- We are one in him. So he's not just talking about us, though it starts with us. Unity, there's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So he's back to the gospel, that hope that we have in Christ. One Lord, okay, so one leader, a master of all of us, one faith, One baptism, 
One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Okay, so we said last week that these are the ones. We're united around the ones. And when a church is united around the ones and nothing else, okay, just the ones, we've said it this way, it, you know, there's, there, when, when there's, when there's uh, core, what's core and essential, there's unity. And there's nothing like this kind of unity. Uh, this is an unstoppable force. When we all rally around the same thing, Gospel-saturated oneness is, is like nothing else on the planet. It's, a, it's a, something that binds us together. So the church is God's people together seeking to accomplish his mission. I was on a mission trip. Uh, I'd gone to speak in Nigeria, Africa, many years ago in Jos, uh, Nigeria. And um, I was in the airport. At, uh, it was Heathrow. I was in London. And I was talking to uh, someone. I think the, the guy at the ticket office was asking me or the, at the the counter was asking me what I was doing, why I was going. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm going to, to lead for a week and preach in different areas there. And a guy behind me, so I wrapped up, and a guy right behind me, uh, very dark-skinned African, and, and he entered into the, uh, asking me what was up and who I was and introduced himself. And um, he was a believer, and he had this, this great you know, British accent, and he was talking. And before, we talked for five minutes about... Um, what we were doing, what he was doing. He was an evangelist, and he was telling me all about how excited he was, what's happening in his country. He's so glad that I'm there. And before it was over, this guy who I just met is praying over me in the concourse, this beautiful prayer that God would bless my life. And I'm just, I'm like, I'm in tears, you know? And we're hugging each other, and we're leaving each other. We were brothers because of Christ. Nothing else in common. But we had Christ in common. And that's all that mattered. And immediately we're brothers. And this is true for all of us and all believers across the globe, which is why we're praying for the churches in Texas, in, in Houston. We're praying for all the churches in Florida because we are one in him. Christ is our unity. But listen, this is not just in theory. This is the real life. This is what we do together. But the way you do this, friends, listen, you can't miss this. It's in close proximity with others. It's what our connect groups are all about. It's what our Sunday school gatherings, our Bible studies are all about. And it's why you need to commit. Last week I said it's much like a, a family meal. You know, growing up our kids all through the years, our family meals, um, when our kids were little, that's the time we had more injuries than any, any other time as a family. I mean, we're kicking over, you know, high chairs and we're slamming. I mean, it was just great. So tell me, sometimes you meet together and you go, that was nuts. Or I'm not sure that we need to keep this pattern going. Um, more people getting hurt. Uh, but, you know, over time, more times than not, it's a very sweet conversation about what's happening in our lives, encouraging each other. And as the kids got older, it was a beautiful thing. It became a normal pattern and it changed the trajectory of our lives as a family. Because we committed to the gathering. And it's true in the family. We come here and take, take, take part of a meal, a banquet that's ultimately going to be the case in glory. You make a commitment, and over time, it'll change the direction of your life. So we're committed in, in the unity of the Spirit. We're growing in the unity of the Spirit. So I want to ask you, are you in a Bible study? You know, have you joined the fellowship of the church? Have you been baptized as a believer? You have opportunity to do that, even today. We'll talk more about that in the, day, in, the, in the time ahead. So first of all, together we're growing in unity in the Spirit. Look, secondly, we're growing in diversity of gifts. Look at verse uh, 7. So I want you to see what Paul does here. He, goes, he starts verse 7. If you have your Bible in front of you, it says this, but, but grace was given to each one of us. Now, watch this. Here's what he's saying. Uh, there's this conjunction now in contrast. So it's kind of like, wait, what, what? So he says, we're one, we're one, we're one. And so we have this sevenfold oneness and it looks like he's kind of contradicting that or going against that because he's saying now on the other hand, he's saying we're one, but each one of us has been given a gift according to the measure of Christ's gift. Notice that it's Christ who gives gifts Therefore, it says, and then he quotes out of Psalm 68, verse 18, 
When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying, now Paul kind of does a little commentary, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? Christ, we read it earlier, Philippians 2, from the very top all the way down to us, deity to humanity, verse 10, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So he's saying this, Christ has all authority. He's the one who can give gifts. He's the gift giver. He's the one who can determine where the gifts go. Now, I don't know if you did this when your kids were little or maybe uh, young parents, check this out. Here's a good thing to do. Or maybe you can do this with a roommate, all right? Um, And it's this. You know when there's a last piece of pie left, right? When there's the last piece of cake and two kids want it. Two roommates fighting over the last sandwich. What do you do? Well, here's the strategy, right? Learned this from Solomon of old. You, you, uh, you cut it. You have one cut it, and the other one chews it, right? You know what I'm talking about. One cuts it, the other chooses it. And it's going to be dead right down the middle. But here's the thing in the church. Christ cuts it, and Christ chooses it. You don't decide what gift you get. He decides what to give you. That's why you can't look at someone else and say, ah, I wish I had that piece. No, he cuts it and he determines who gets what gifts. And your gift is the one that he has given. Look at what it says. Then it goes on uh, to explain how this works. He gave some, all right, your, your translation might say he gave some to be. The ESV says he gave the apostles, he gave the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. That's, that last one is actually a kind of a hyphenated shepherd, teacher, pastor, shepherd, pastor, teacher. Um, and that's, that's my role primarily, others of us, among us. But he's given some to be called out to lead in the church. And this is not just clergy, though, though I would say this, this group, probably in our context, more those who've been called into vocational ministry, but it's also those who've been raised up as leaders in the church. And he says, here's why he's given certain ones of these gifts. And I could say it in our context. It's why we have a staff. What is it? To do all the work of the ministry. Let's just put it on them. No, it says to equip the saints. That would be you. That's that word is holy ones, hagion in the Greek. Those who've been saved for the work of ministry to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all, everybody say all, all attain to the unity of the faith And of the knowledge of the Son of God. So this unity of the faith, which he's talked about earlier, this this sevenfold uh, oneness that we have together, to mature manhood, to a mature personhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow. The fullness of Christ in us. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now, see, he's he's saying, look, there's this there's this thing that's going on here. Uh, You're you're children until you grow up. But what he talks about is is this this diversity of gifts that he's given to all of us. He's given us gifts to be used. And and so, as he says, we're one, but we're all different. And in his case, this was radical unity. Or how about radical diversity? You could say in unity is when you have Jews and Gentiles coming together in the same family. Radical stuff. And for us, it would be those who are formerly, whether Muslim or or, or non-believers or or atheists or, or just cultural Christians having never received Christ, It would be black and white. It'd be Asian. And it would be every ethnicity, every background. It'd be young and old together in the body. There's this unity in diversity. And friends, listen, listen. Most churches don't do this well. Most churches struggle to do this because it is hard. It's a hard thing to do. And we have the opportunity as a church to be a church across generations and and, and people from all backgrounds uh, to to actually show the world what this looks like. 
And I'm so encouraged when people show up and they sense that happening here. This unity in the body. You know, churches split over crazy non-core issues. Churches split over, sorry, guests, but split over the color of the carpet, or the color of paint on the wall, or the music that, that is sung in a church, or what people wear. Just crazy stuff. Stories are, are unbelievable. But what we've said, in all things core, there's unity. And we've been given the ones to guide us. The gospel is core. Jesus is central. Everything else is open for change. And in all things that are non-core, there's freedom. And we're going to listen and be patient with one another. Seeking to understand. Not seeking to listen so that I can show you how you're wrong. But listen so I can understand your point of view. And that's something so needed in our culture today. But in all things, there's grace. Notice Christ has given these gifts. Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 4.10. You can see it there. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Friends, you're a steward of the gift that you've been given. How are you doing? How are you doing with your gift that you've been given? Out of his generosity, Christ gives each of us gifts. Every single one of us. And so we're all contributors, not consumers. The, the paid staff doesn't do all the work. and Instead, we come alongside and equip the saints to do the work of ministry. You know, football season's a good time to remind us uh, of that picture in a stadium where you have thousands of people who are cheering on 11 players, their team out there on the field. Right? 11 players in desperate need of rest thousands of people and millions watching by television who are in desperate need of exercise. <laughs> and listen, God's called every one of us to be on the field. Every one of us. He's called every... Listen, how about this? Let's let the watching world be those in the, in the stands. That's the point. The watching world says, wow, how they serve each other. Wow, how they serve the world. Look at how humble they are, how gentle, how patient and loving they are. Look at how the grace of God has changed their lives. But friends, don't desire someone else's gift. See, here's what happens. We get off track and we go, you know what? I think God's, I think God's called me to lead. Well, no, probably not. No, God's called me to, well, to sing. Well, I'm not sure about that one. We have folks that help determine that. Uh, God's called me to, to, to do this or that. God's called, listen, for those of you whom uh, you're serving behind the scenes, I know in our culture it's possible, you know, I want to be the guy up on stage or I want to be the guy singing. I want to be the, you know, the, whatever that. Listen, here's the thing. I am, the Lord's given me certain gifts. I'm servant number one. That's who I am. I want to wash the feet of every person in here. Because God's called us to serve each other. But for those of you who are serving our children, in fact, I want to ask you, how many of you are serving right now our preschool, our children, or our youth? I want you to just raise your hand high as if to praise the Lord Jesus. Because I want to tell you something. We praise God for you. We thank God for you. I know that my, my sweet wife who has certain gifts that I don't have, she's... She's taking care of a group teaching two-year-olds right now what it is to know that God loves them and to follow Jesus. And she gets so much joy from that. Now, I'd, I'd have a lot of fun doing that, but not all of you would, right? I mean, we all have different gifts. And here's what I'd say. If you're not serving, you're not bringing your diverse gift to the body. There's something, listen, that's happening no, there's something that's not happening that is supposed to be happening through your life. And as we move forward, the vision forward as a church is every person serving, all hands on deck. You're not a spectator. You're on the field. So the operative question for every person, and our deacons are leading the way. This is the question. What's your ministry? What are you doing? How are you serving? And this is not the pastor just kind of trying to beat you down. I hope you don't hear that. I want you to experience the great joy of ministry. Some of us get bored with church. Well, no wonder you're not serving. 
You're not watching the Lord show up in ways every week as you seek to step out in faith and serve. So we're, we're, we're growing together. We're growing in unity of the Spirit. We're growing in diversity of gifts. And then thirdly, finally, we're growing in maturity of Christ. We're growing in the maturity of Christ. So look at verse um, 13. I read a little bit of that. And we'll press on to the last part of this passage. So he says this. Until we all reach this unity, right? The knowledge, uh, faith and the knowledge of the Son, the mature manhood. See, we're supposed to grow up. We're not supposed to remain children. We're not Peter, Pan, you know, Peter Pan kind of syndrome the rest of our lives. He says, no, 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 grow up. Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love. This is an interesting word. It, we could say it this way, though we don't really say it this way. But we're, we're to truth each other. We need to be truthing each other. It's speaking truth. Parents, you need to be truthing your kids. Speaking truth of God's word into their lives. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From whom the whole body, you see the analogy here, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I love that. He starts and ends with love. So thirdly, growing. We are growing in maturity of Christ. And you say, well, how does that happen around here? It happens in our, our connect groups. It happens on Sunday morning. From the youngest to the eldest, we get in our, our groups. We, we come alongside others. Because friends, listen, if you don't do this, here's what he's saying. You're going to be swept away and led to destruction by false theologies. But instead, we study the word together. So let's apply this. Questions. Are you growing in unity of the spirit? Are you humble? Would people around you describe you as gentle? Those who know you the best, would they say you're patient? A roommate or a friend or a spouse. Secondly, are you growing in diversity of gifts? I've already challenged you a bit there. But are you giving yourself to others through the local church. This fall, gang, I'm praying for a volunteer revolution in our church. That every person who is not serving will step up and answer the question. Because again, unique to us, we are a two time slot Sunday morning church. You know, we, we I mean, some of you are in groups and Bible studies throughout the week, and there's other opportunities. But you can come, your kids are cared for and guided and led. And you can be in a class and you can go to worship. Commit to Sunday mornings. And for all of you who are serving our children, I praise God for you. Those of you who teach our adults, praise God for you. Are you giving faithfully to the church? That's another thing. You know, you know babies, they, they don't share well. I mean, kids don't do that. My dog's like, no, mine. I mean, it, that's, that's baby stuff. And he says, no, grow up. Are you serving? Are you giving faithfully to your church? So unity and diversity brings maturity in Christ. Now, before we close, I just want to cast a little vision forward over the next 90 days, kind of up to, to De December into Christmas. We have started our Wednesday night programming, and it has been awesome. To see all of you up here, really an, an on-ramp into life, our church, our marriage core has started. 30-plus uh, couples are, are going deep, uh, really seeking to grow in their marriage. Our nearlyweds now meet on Wednesday nights. Bible studies for students, for children. We have a wana where we're learning scripture. We've got uh, choirs for children, adults, orchestra. There's something for everybody. We have an Espanol Estudio Biblico on the Wednesday nights, and you can be here. Uh, there's care and recovery groups for everybody. Listen, I'm starting a men's Bible study uh, this Thursday morning from 7 to 8. It's over in the west uh, side of our campus. Just show up, and we'll guide you up to the third floor. But men, come. Come join me. Come join other men. Men with men growing, being accountable, leading out, and seeking the Lord. We're going to be in Bible study together. Come join us. As we move into October, we're going to talk about the new Reformation and, and talk about deep theological truth that guides our lives. Uh, you may know this is the 500th year of the, of the Reformation, and we're celebrating in October, even as we look at uh, 
uh, the days to come. We're going to be moving towards uh, November the 5th. And here's what I want to say. You're going to hear more about this in the days to come, but I need everybody to listen in. This is a little family meeting, but on October the 1st, I'm challenging all of us uh, towards a really what's kind of a summer catch-up day in regard to our giving. You can always look in our bulletin, kind of see where we are. Right now we're about 234, I think it is, $234,000 back from where we ought to be right now. And we can make that up together. We don't want to go into the holiday season that far back. And so I want to challenge you. There's a day, it's October the 1st, you can remember that. Give on that day or prior to that day. You can look in your bulletin and also see how you can give electronically. And I want every one of us to give. Do your part. All of us doing a bit together and before or on that day. Uh, we've got lots going on right now. You may not know, there's about $1.5 million a, a worth of construction work on our campus going on right now. For our children all the way to our seniors and, and those who, who need access into our sanctuary. All of us can step up. So if you've been out through the summer and some of you have just seen showing up just like recently. So I know a lot of it's been gone, but you can give and do so before October the 1st, because what's going to happen, gang, as we move forward, I see a church that is, is serving across the life uh, of, of our body. I see people coming early. The church I envision is one that's so passionate about its gatherings that we can't wait to get here. I see parents guiding their children and young people here every Sunday. And we're, 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 we're challenged or we're, we're disappointed when we don't have someone alongside us that we invited to come. I see a church that's loving our city in such profound ways that we're building bridges across racial and ethnic lines, across educational business, uh, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. I see a church that is so in love with Jesus that the world can but take note and see how much we love each other. On your way out today, uh, you, you'll receive one of these. I want you to grab one. Make sure you do. Uh, this is a puzzle piece that I want you to grab and take with you. It says on it, the power of one. And I want you to put this in a prominent place. And I want you to pray. Every time you see it, pray for your church. Watch for a 40-day um, prayer guide that's going to lead us 40 days of prayer as we move towards uh, November 5th and then into uh, the Christmas season. I want to close with this. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher who preached uh, in the late 1800s at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. He writes this. Listen in. Give yourself. This is actually during, in a sermon on 2 Corinthians 8, 5. Give yourself to the church. You that are members of the church have not found it perfect. And I hope that you feel almost glad that you have not. If you had never joined a church till I... No, he says, I, if I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I would never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it for it would not have been perfect, a perfect church after I had become a member of it. Still imperfect as it is. Listen to this. It is the dearest place on earth. All of us have first given ourselves to the Lord and everyone who has given themselves to the Lord should as speedily as possible also give themselves to the Lord's people. How else is there to be a church on the earth? If it is right for anyone to refrain from membership in the church, it's right for everyone. And the testimony for God would be lost in the world. As I have already said, the church is faulty, but that is no excuse for you're not joining it if you are the Lord's. Nor need your own faults keep you back. For the church is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who, though they are saved, are still sinners and need all the help they can derive from the sympathy and guidance of their fellow believers. The church is the nursery of God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow strong. It is the fold of Christ's sheep, the home of Christ's family. Friends, the church is a big deal to God, and it's a big deal in your life. 
Let's commit ourselves, recommit ourselves anew to his church today. Let's all pray together as we close our time. I want you to just surrender your life to the Lord. And friend, if you're here today and you have never received Christ, today's your day. He, he died on the cross for your sin. Receive him by grace. His, his, his grace by faith right now. Just say, Lord, come into my life. Thank you for forgiving me of my sin. And friend, if you're here today, today's the day. Maybe you didn't come ready or prepared to join the church, but if you've received Christ or if you want to talk to somebody about that, today's your day. Why would you wait any longer? Don't waste your life. If you're here today and you want to be baptized, I don't know why anyone who knows the Lord Jesus has received his grace wouldn't want to be baptized to show the world what he's done. You can do it today. We'd love to talk to you about that. If you're not in a group, I don't know why you wouldn't go. Find one today. Give your life to the church. If you're not serving, serve. Surrender your life to the Lord. Lord, we love you. We surrender our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.